my name, Yolandi Kenward, but I have changed my name. But Kenward is the name that I was born with. Um, in 1996, I was the Kent Businesswoman of the Year. And at that time, I decided that if you have power and influence, you should be using power and influence for the better of all people that you come in contact with. And that was the way I thought I would lead my business life from there on in. However, things didn't quite go to plan. And um, what happened to me was that in 2000, I had a medical accident. And that really changed the course of my life quite dramatically. And um, I need to tell you what happened in this medical accident. On the 14th of February, 2000, I went into the BMI Summerfield Hospital in Maidstone. I'd been persuaded by a surgeon, Dr. Anne Henderson, that I needed an operation very quickly. Uh, I had no intentions of going into the Summerfield. I wanted to go into the NHS, but Miss Henderson persuaded me that I had cancer. And as it turned out, I didn't. But I decided to drop everything and rush into the Summerfield on the 14th of February 2000. I went in in the afternoon. I was, there was due to be four of us to have a uh, hysterectomy that afternoon. Um, Miss Henderson had been operating that morning in the Maystone Hospital. And I got there in time to be prepped, ready for the operation. As it turned out, I was the last one to be operated on that afternoon. Somebody came in uh, before the operation and tried to persuade me to have an epidural. I said, no, I've got a thing about epidurals. I don't want an epidural. And um, the next thing was I went into the theater and uh, I remember looking at the clock when I went into the theater, but when I came out from the operating theater, I wasn't very well. And I was very frightened. And um, for some reason, I felt the need to st <coughs> stay awake all night. And I had a fear that if I went to sleep, that I wouldn't wake up again. So I fought the anesthesia, anesthetic, and I stayed awake all night. And in the morning, I, in, during the night, I, I had what I now know as a TIA. I couldn't speak. And uh, a nursing assistant came into the room in the night, and I couldn't speak to her. I felt very frightened. And by the time I got to the morning, I was very, very exhausted. And I wanted to know why I'd had an adverse reaction to an anaesthetic, because I'd never had a problem before. But I couldn't get the answers. And I wanted to see my surgeon, and she didn't want to see me. And that was on the Monday. By the time it got to the Thursday, I was quite stressed out and anxious and upset. And uh, the response of the hospital at that stage was, because I had whiplash injuries, was to go to the retreat hospital, retreat beauty center across the road and get me uh, somebody to massage my neck. I also got a friend of mine, Margaret Kenyon, to come in to give me some Reiki treatment to try and de-stress me because of the state I was in after this operation. When it got to the Thursday, I'd had enough of the surgeon avoiding me. So I, I rang um, Dr. David Penman, who bought my old home in Grove Green, and I said, David, can you take over my care? And he said, yes. So I then contacted the nurse and said, that's it. I don't want to see Miss Henderson anymore. I've had enough of it. She's not giving me the answers I need. And um, David Penman's taking over. Well, the next thing that happened was um, I, the nurse came back in and said, Miss Henderson's teaching over at Medway, but she's coming straight over here to see you now. I said, I don't want to see her. She's not my uh, doctor anymore. Dr. Penman is. Anyway, the next thing is, I'm lying in my bed feeling really unwell, and in bursts Miss Henderson shouting at me, and I thought, my God. And I ignored her, and then she eventually went out. David Penman came in the next day, the Friday of that week, and he looked after me. And I was discharged on the Saturday. The operation was supposed to be a three-day operation and stay in the hospital. That was three and a half thousand pounds. I didn't have the money. I put it on a BMI credit card. 
but I stayed for an extra two days because I was so unwell. I was discharged on the Saturday, but instead of David Penman doing um, my discharge notes, the person that did my discharge notes was Miss Henderson. And in my discharge note to my GP, Dr. Gosmark at the Bisted Medical Practice, she effectively stated, Yolandi is mad. I thought, why? Why have you done this? Why haven't you mentioned the fact that I'm traumatised got PTSD, a needle stick injury, um, had whiplash injuries, and have been discharged with two infections, one of which is MRSA. But that's basically what happened. You know, I didn't find out all of those things for quite a long time afterwards, but that's what I found out had actually happened. I had all those things go wrong. So um, I came out of that hospital really unwell, Nobody telling me that I had a needle stick injury in MRSA. And I went home and uh, I, I was allowed to wander around in the Maystone NHS hospital in my doctor's surgery over to other hospitals with MRSA and an open wound. I decided that there was, I had a health and safety business at that time and we were doing the health and safety training for the safety advisor at the Summerfield, and I also had the business development manager from the Summerfield on my Kent Business Network Committee too. So I decided to do quite a lot of research into what had gone on in my, my medical um, accident because I wanted answers, because answers would be healing. So what I decided to do was to um, form the Patient Support Trust, which I did in 2000. And by that stage, I had been doing quite a lot of voluntary work with children for about two or three years. So I decided to combine my two current interests in 2000, reducing the risk for patients and reducing the risk for children. And that's how I ended up founding the Patient Support Trust. So, but unfortunately, although I founded it with all the good intentions, like everything else I did after that, it all got smashed up. So this is about resurrecting the, the Patient Support Trust to reduce the risk for patients and children because I believe that the problems that were there in 2000 are still problems now. I started to investigate medical scandals in 2000 as well because around that time there were the Shipman scandals and there was the um, Dr Rodney Ledwood scandal in Kent and I thought, what is it? What is the mechanism that keeps these scandals going? for so many years before they surface. So I started digging and researching, digging and researching, and now I, I fully know what it is that um, keeps these scandals going. The BMI Summerfield Hospital group, it's called the BMI Health, Healthcare Group, was bought um, by a syndicate in, in 2000, in September 2000. And that syndicate over the next five years made a profit of 6.6 .6 billion. Europe's largest ever profit. And I'm a witness to what was going on in this country to help them make that profit. And that profit is one of my biggest problems today because um, of what I tried to do to get Maystone Police to investigate in relation to the Summerfield. When I realised that there was something badly wrong in the Summerfield, I tried to get Maystone Police interest. Um, I told them the health and safety reasons, I told them what I knew had happened to me, but I couldn't get them to give me a crime reference. So in the end, I found a way of getting a crime reference. I, I went over to Rochester Police Station and I went to their assault clinic. And via their assault clinic in Rochester, I got a crime reference for the Summerfield and it was CZ853301. Um, that's 15 years ago, and I'm still pursuing that investigation um, that I started at that time via Rochester Police Station. Until I contacted the police over the Summerfield, I had no idea the way that police in this country could behave, because I'd always believed that they were honest, straightforward, 
people who you rang them up, um, you reported a crime, they investigated the crime, and that was it. But for the first time in my life, I started to see behaviour from police that I had no idea existed. I had police terrorising me and harassing me and absolutely behaving like thugs. And it was all to do with the BMI Summerfield Hospital. So that was quite an eye-opener to me, that that was actually going on. And um, basically, I watched over those uh, five, six years. And uh, yes, it took me 55 months before I actually got the evidence that I'd ever had MRSA, that one of the two infections I had was MRSA. And how did I get that evidence? Well, I wrote to Rose Gibb, who was running Maystone Hospital, and she quite innocently sent me my hospital notes, and there it was, I'd had MRSA. They'd kept it a secret for all that time. And over those four or five years, what was going on was that um, there was selective newspaper stories about where MRSA was coming from. The newspaper stories were always saying that MRSA was coming from the NHS, that nobody was saying it was coming from a private hospital. So I thought, hmm, very interesting that that is going on. So I learned a lot uh, by that, but the next, what I need to do now is to go back to what happened when I went into the courts. And then I'll come back to how they made that 6.6 .6 billion profit, because I, I also saw um, NHS contracts uh, being given to the Summerfield. They were giving NHS contracts to put MRSA patients into the Summerfield. Well, one of the problems with the Summerfield at that time was that they didn't have proper sterilisation equipment. They do have now, but they were short of money. They were cutting corners, they didn't have a doctor on duty the night I was there. They, they were um, over anaesthetizing patients to cut back on nursing costs at that time. Um, and certainly the fact that they didn't have proper sterilization equipment was, was certainly a problem at that time. Okay, well that's where it was coming from. MRSA was coming from that hospital and I was being used or allowed to spread it into Maystone Hospital. And when I turned up at Maystone Hospital really ill, having been sent in there by my surgery, I was lying in A&E when Miss Henderson turned up and she started, I could hear her on the other side of the curtain telling her nursing colleagues that I was a mad woman. And then they admitted me onto the ward there when she must have known I had MRSA and I didn't. So uh, some real strange games going on. Let's move on to what happened next. Well, BMI, the BMI group um, decided to sue me. They wanted not only three and a half thousand pounds that was on the BMI credit card. They wanted 1,500 pounds for the extra two days I had to spend in, in their hospital because I was so ill. So they sued me. But it had already cost me far in excess of 5,000 pounds to um, put right what they'd done, let alone my loss of earnings. And I was earning over 150,000 a year at the time. So I thought, OK, um, they started a, an action in Croydon. And Croydon, by the way, is where Helen Grant had a firm of solicitors. So they started an action in Croydon. The BMI um, solicitors were in Croydon. And um, they were women, women solicitors. And it was called CRO, which is Croydon, 5520 or 5220 or something like that. Anyway, it got transferred to the Maystone County Court. And I thought, good, I'll put in a counterclaim. Um, counterclaim for my loss of injuries, uh, for my loss of earnings and my injuries and everything else. 
So that's what I did. And in the meantime, since I came out of the summer field, I was asking for my medical records. 28 days I'm supposed to get my medical records in. And there I was, 16 months down the line, with a court hearing looming, and I still hadn't got my medical records. I'd also been trying to get medical e expert evidence to use in the court, and I found that everybody was closing ranks, and the one expert, Professor Reynolds, who would give a report, was covering up. And I only found one doctor in the UK, um, Dr. Jeff Roberts, and one in Switzerland, Dr. Dominic Schwander, who would actually help me because doctors protect doctors and they were closing ranks. So I learnt that um, I was in a scandal because of the way people were behaving. If they hadn't been behaving so oddly, I wouldn't know that I was in the middle of a scandal. So it went to court and uh, I started to see odd things going on, judges trying to undermine the case before it even got to court. So I thought, this is most odd. And uh, I went, I was referred by somebody to Furley Page Solicitors in Canterbury, a lady solicitor down there. But she, I found she was undermining my case. I thought, she's useless, so I sacked her. Some, some three months later, we ended up having a court hearing and I thought, right, there's some hanky-panky going on down this court. Um, I'm going to bring a reporter with me. So I brought Craig Tucker, a reporter, into the court with me, with my PA um, at that time, Pat, Pat Shanahan. Well, what I saw down there absolutely amazed me. And what happened down there absolutely amazed me, because I had this idea about our courts being uh, dispensers of justice, that the judges were wise people who listened to the evidence and, and, you know, decided things fairly. Well, first of all, um, the BMI barrister turned up, that was a lady, she was in one waiting room, and then lo and behold, my, my sacked solicitor from three months earlier appeared. And what did she do? First of all, she went in and had a, a chat with the BMI barrister. She submitted uh, a statement to court as well, saying, you know, is mad. And then she went off, and I followed her, and she went off in to see the judge. Yeah? We then went to go into court. Um, Pat Shanahan and Craig Tucker weren't allowed to go in with me. I had to go in on my own. At that stage, I just found out from the Beersted Medical Practice Manager that about my medical records, and she'd written to me and said, your records have been sent in part to your solicitor. And I thought, what solicitor? I don't have one. So I went into court, and it was only listed for half an hour, and I thought, this is strange, because my claim's worth about half a million. So I went in there, and um, one of the first things I said to the judge was, I've, I've just had this letter from, from, from my surgery. Um, who's got my medical records? And the judge smiled at me and told me Furley Page. I said, what? How does she know that? Well, of course, I'd seen um, the Furley Page solicitor go in and brief the judge. The next thing that happened was, um, I'm starting to talk about my needing my medical records and whatever, and, and the judge is just smiling at me. And in the end, she's sitting on a raised bench, and I'm sitting below, and there's these other women in court with me, and this is Judge Burgess. She said to me, if we want you to lose, you will lose. I thought, what? How dare you talk to me like that? And the hearing finished. It only lasted half an hour. It finished. I came out of the court. I went round to the county court. Um, counter, the admin counter, and I said, I want a copy of the tape of that hearing. Well, they said, um, the judge chose not to record it. I said, oh, really? Yeah. And true to her word, if we want you to lose, you will lose. What did the judge do next? Well, she personally pursued me into the Maidstone County Court bankruptcy section. She wanted both of my properties. I had a six-bedroom farmhouse at Leeds and an office block up at Lordswood. 
for this disputed £5,000 debt, which I had a half million counterclaim against, she wanted both my properties. So what happened next? I ended up in the bankruptcy court, yeah. And um, I went down to see Whitehead Monkton solicitors and I took my court file with me and um, they gave me advice. And if I'd followed that advice, I now know I would have been bankrupt. But fortunately, at that time, I was attending Kent Against Injustice meetings run by Barbara Stone and other people in the Maystone area. And I met a guy called Peter Hayward, a businessman from Tunbridge. And he was coordinator of the Litigants in Person Society. And that Litigants in Person Society largely um, was made up of over 100 people who were fake bankruptcies. Wealthy people, respectable people, who would you know, suddenly be go, find themselves in court over a small debt. And then from the small debt, they end up in the bankruptcy court. And um, I believe that part of that group was also um, some decent Freemasons, three of them, who were trying to help the Duke of Kent get his defrauded Royal Masonic Hospital money back. And they got maliciously made bankrupt too. So it was quite an eye-opener to me to realise that in this country, up and down the country, over a small debt, you can be made maliciously bankrupt to protect somebody else, a big business. So what happened next? Um, it, we, Peter Hayward gave me the correct advice as, as a litigant in person, and he and I went up to the um, Royal Courts of Justice Bankruptcy Court, and um, we stopped my fake bankruptcy, um, but I still had to pay the 5,000. So that's how I got out of the bankruptcy by paying their bill. And um, because of the research I was doing into medical accidents, I realized um, I had a world leading medical accident website for, for four years, 2000 to 2004. I realized that far from having a compensation culture that the media tells us we have, we don't. That there's probably only 0.01% of people who ever get compensation for a medical accident because of the network that's in place to cover up for claims that people have, genuine claims that people have. And then the only people that I believe get compensation are Freemasons. And then they get it in a blaze of publicity to try and persuade people um, that there is a compensation culture and it's disgusting that we have this compensation culture. And as a parallel, I'll talk about Leslie Ash because she got, I think, about half a million or more for a similar thing to MRSA. And ironically, I've actually met Leslie Ash because um, when I lived in Grove Green, they came to film. She was, she was on the Cat Size team and they came and filmed in my house an episode of Cat Size. So I, I met Leslie Ash and then I noticed that she actually got a huge compensation for what happened to her. Compensation that's just not available for you and I. It's only available for a select few. So this, that was my introduction. Um, that if we want you to lose just made me so angry and I couldn't believe it's going on. But my whole experience of the last 15 years is that is exactly the way all our courts are operating up and down the country. If nobody's got a problem with you, then you can get justice. But if somebody um, doesn't want you to win, you won't win. And my experience of Maidstone is that the police and the courts, both of them, are run for the benefit of the upper classes and big business. And um, I want that to change. I believe in justice for all. And um, I decided on the 28th of April this year to stop doing all my voluntary legal work for people up and down the country because I'm wasting my time. You can't get justice if somebody doesn't want you to get justice. And, and um, a lot of the things I've been specializing in in the last few years has been children's cases. And the reasons I've um, specialized in them is because that's where I believe the most evil is actually taking place, what's happening to parents and children being avoidably separated. 
So that's where I've got to. And, and um, I want this attitude, if we want you to lose, you will lose, to change. And as I believe the problems are far worse here in Maidstone than, than anywhere else, then change has got to come here. And my experiences are fairly horrendous, but they're so extreme as to um, be able to help facilitate this change. And I hope that that's where I'm going to go. Are we all right so far? Yeah. Next. I'll go on to that in a moment. Um, so this 6.6 .6 billion profit, um, it's clearly been made. I mean, I'm only one example of the public purse. I mean, the Maystone County Court, the taxpayers pay for that. And they're paying to protect the profits of this BMI Summerfield Hospital Group, 6.6 .6 billion. Now, um, and the selective media stories that terrify people into buying private medical insurance, and the fact that cronies um, in the NHS hand out all these contracts to the BMI group to help them. Um, because I was researching what was going on, I was very acutely aware that in June 2001, the headlines of the Maystone Kent Messenger were that next April, all Maystone GPs are going to leave the NHS. I thought, oh, OK. Um, and, and that's a fact. You can go and look in their archives and you'll find a headline from the Maystone KM, all Maystone GPs to leave the NHS in April 2002. When that newspaper came out, there was a terror campaign at my home. It was horrendous. Threats to section me, all sorts of things. But I'm very proud that because of my humanitarian work at that time, that um, you aren't all paying £55 to see a GP, which was the intention back in 2001. The uh, Maystone led the way in the UK to bring down the NHS. It did it via the KM, um, but it is still going. Um, it wasn't privatised. GPs weren't charging you £55 to see a GP and they're still not charging you £55 to see a GP. Now, this BMI profit um, of £6.6 .6 billion, as I said, it, it, when they made it, it was Europe's largest ever. Well, when you start to see the favours going on, you can see how you can make £6.6 .6 billion profit. Now, they were doing OK with this £6.6 .6 billion profit. I mean, I'd been to Maystone Police with my crime reference complaining about the mismanagement of epidurals and I hadn't consented to an epidural and whatever, and that's all in my CZ853301 file. Well, we were going okay until March 2004. What happened in March 2004? Well, unfortunately, a lady from Yeoman's Lane in Beersted, Mrs. Ledwin Demain, died. She'd been a BMI Summerfield Hospital patient, and she died. What did she die of? what I've been complaining about, mismanagement of epidurals. So we have a problem here. You know, someone's died avoidably of what I've been complaining about. So what do we do in Maystone? We blame the person that's the whistleblower, the one that's likely to speak out and say something. So the, the harassment of me got a hundred times worse. Um, then it came to the inquest of Mrs. Ledwin Domain. And that was going to be, uh, as I recall, down at KCC County Hall. So I thought, right, I'll go down there and I'll um, speak about this mismanagement of epidural and how people hadn't been doing their jobs in Maidstone. They'd been covering up Maidstone Police, Maidstone County Court, and Widdicombe because I went to her too and she didn't want to know. And people hadn't been doing their jobs in Maystone. The KM didn't want to know. And then this woman had died avoidably. But could I get down to the inquest? No, I was in my farmhouse, pinned down with bailiffs, harassing me to keep me pinned into my farmhouse. Meanwhile, uh, a Kent Messenger reporter 
had reported had made a bomb scare in Maystone Town Centre so that the town got gridlocked as well. So I never did get to that inquest. But that, that's an illustration of some of those things that go on. Now, I believe that that death of that woman puts that 6.6 .6 billion um, and what happened to me at risk under the Proceeds of Crime Act. That's what I believe. So I'm still pushing for Maystone Police to carry on their investigation and do it properly and see what money they can get back into the Maystone Council tax purse via that investigation and that poor woman's death. So that's more or less where I got to with medical accidents. Around 2003, I got um, involved with Ian Joseph um, because I was, he was an ex-conservative Kent County councillor. Uh, he has uh, a law degree from Oxford and he also runs language schools and at that time I was taking in foreign children into my home to teach them English because my businesses by that stage had been smashed up and uh, so that's how I was trying to earn a living and um, so that's how I came across him but I also came back across him some years later because of my work with children. Ian, I think, was a county councillor here, conservative one, 40 years ago. And even 40 years ago, he was, um, parents were coming to him saying, there's something wrong with social services, my children are being taken off me wrongly. So he used to go to court and win the court cases and get the parents back their children. He's a multimillionaire, he uses his own money to help parents who can't get justice in the courts over here, and he helps them to flee the country. Anyway, in about 2002, he um, coined the term forced adoption, which is now used up and down the country. And he is probably the UK's leading expert on what goes on in our family courts. He's based in Monaco. He would have been here today, but he's got um, friends staying this weekend. But he, I saw him at the Children's Screaming to be Heard con concert um, conference a couple of months ago so I'm about to show um, what he was saying then about um, children attention please attention please please leave the building immediately oh my god please leave the building immediately by the nearest exit uh, my name is Ian Josephs. Uh, I run a site called Forced Adoption and try and help uh, mothers especially, but fa fathers also, uh, whose children have been taken. Now, what I'd like to just try and do in, in shortly is to say what is wrong, then why it's gone wrong, and then what, we, what can be done to put it right. So firstly, what's wrong? Well, social workers were formed in 1948 to support families in distress. That sounds a joke now, but that's what they were formed for. And alas, gradually, even the uh, vice chair of the Association of Social Workers, Maggie Millen, has said it's, it's all turned into, ch into child protection. As she says, We'll be looking back, perhaps, in 30 years' time, and she's a social worker, a chief one, uh, we'll be looking back in 30 or 40 years' time in horror at what we're doing now, just as we look back now at all those 150,000 British children who were sent to Australia for forced labour. We look and say, how could they do that? Because the people who do these things are sincere, uh, but... Uh, there's, no, there's nothing so dangerous as a bunch of do-gooders, I often think. You know? <laughs> People who think they're doing good, they're not. I mean, after all, Catholics and Protestants were slaughtering each other, you know, and even, uh, 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 for a difference in dogma. And, uh, and, and both very sincere, I'm sure. 
But uh, and even the concentration gu gu camp guards at Auschwitz were probably sincere. They really thought they were doing the right thing, wiping people out and sending the gas ovens, because that's what they were taught. So it doesn't mean because you think you're doing good, you are doing good. And so now we've got the state of the art social workers. Uh, if you were uh, you, you heard a social worker come to your next-door neighbour and she was out. And you said to her when she came back to a single mum, single mum with a couple of children, you said, oh, dear, yeah, a social worker came to see you. Now, she wouldn't say, oh, dear, what a pity. I wish I'd met her. <laughs> She'd say, oh, my God, she's after the children. And that's, what's, that's what it's come down to, come from, from support when they were first formed to stealing the children for a, for, for a second. Can we have respect for the speaker, please? Oh, don't Sit worry. the back, talking, stop it, or get out. Oh, I, I don't expect... <laughs> don't worry, I never expect anybody to respect me. <laughs> I'm not disappointed. No, so... <clears throat> so, I'd like to sort of point out a few things which you can use in future arguments, maybe, with other people. The first one is this, that the UK is the only country in the world where a, a regular stream of mothers, especially, uh, leave to have their babies in other countries to stop them being taken. Yes, in other countries they do take children, but the UK is the only one where people are driven to leave the country to get out of it. Uh, and that, and that is, that is, that is a, a, a terrible thing, but it's... It's absolutely true. Also, the UK is the only country, certainly in Europe and probably the rest of the world, where nearly every town, nearly every major town, has a family court filled to bursting with people trying to keep their children and failing mostly. That doesn't happen anywhere else. They do take children elsewhere, but that doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, so, is it just to make money or is there something... I'll, I shall come on to that. Uh, and show you why this has happened, and money is the chief reason. Um, but I just wanted to draw your attention to, the, to, the, to, to, to these facts, that, that the, this, this happens in the UK as opposed to other places, <clears throat> and that's why people leave. I mean, in France, where I live most of the time, in Monaco, they, they think I'm exaggerating, they don't believe me when I say that you can take a child at birth from a mother uh, for risk of emotional abuse. I mean, what rubbish is that? But uh, they, don't, they hardly believe me. It just wouldn't happen in the Latin countries. But uh, there we are. Now, why does this happen? Yeah, it happens because, <coughs> there's, as you put your finger on it, there's money to be made. As uh, it was very pretty well presented um, by Sue Reed earlier, for the, if, if you were here to hear, hear her, um, the people who make the most are the, what they call the adoption and fostering agencies. These are people who supply uh, adoptive parents' addresses and fostering addresses to the local authority. Uh, they probably get for uh, a fostering, uh, to supply fostering, uh, they don't get one payment, they get about 1,500 quid a week um, while the fostering lasts, of which they pass on over 500 very generously to the fosterers and uh, keep the balance. The National Fostering and Adoption Agency, for one, was, uh, was uh, formed um, about 12 years ago by two social workers. Let's start an agency, they said, and they did. And uh, they sold out two years ago to a commercial firm called Graphite for 130 million. That's the sort of money that's being made. You will... Each from start to finish, well, I put it this way, that the official... I've got on my site um, the links to various government statistics, and one that is very striking is that the cost, on the whole, for each child, the cost to, to the taxpayer uh, for the whole system is £2,900 and a, few, a bit more for each child per week. Not per month, not per year. To, so, 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 so that's uh, that's uh, going some. Am I just it, sorry? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it, the whole industry is a billion-pound industry. Now, sometimes social workers will say, 
you know, this is rubbish what these people uh, say in public about us making a lot of money. The council doesn't make any money. It has to spend money to put, to put these people into foster care. So why should we do that? And the answer is simple enough. Since when did civil servants care a damn whether the local authority made money? It's when they make money themselves that they care. Of course the local authorities, councils all over the country are wasting money not, on, not just on childcare but on all sorts of things. The people working for them don't give a damn as long as they don't get into trouble, as long as they feather their own nests and they get massive salaries. When I first came to, to, uh, to Ramsgate to run a hotel when I was 22, um, I negotiated with it for, with the town clerk, as he was called then, and he had a salary about double the average wage. Now they're called uh, um, chief executives, and they get hundred thousand, two hundred thousand a year. You see, I mean, it's uh, it's the greedy, it's the greedy lot. Now, not only not only that, but um, that that's one source of money. The other is this: the the private children's homes, as they're called. Now these 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 cost these these costs so much. Uh, it's you know it it costs about a, nearly a thousand pounds a week to send Prince, Prince Harry to Eton, uh, which has enormous facilities, obviously because it's the most it's the poshest school in the country and the most expensive. Well, children's homes charge at least three times that, and who gets the money? The people who run those homes, and. Where do the social workers get any money out of this? Well, it's their mates, their friends who run these schools and who run these agencies, very often retired social workers or social workers who got fed up with being social workers and decided there was more in business. And then the social workers, other social workers, they recommend the agencies. There's a lot of agencies, so we'll, we'll, we'll give our, 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 this child here we're taking from the parents, we'll, we'll give it to this agency to sort out a fosterer. And of course, we want a little commission for that. What evidence is there of that? It's pretty hard to get evidence, but we did get it once. Um, a Greek fellow, in fact, uh, his daughter was pretty cute, sort of, uh, when I say that, uh, clever, you know. And she stole uh, the uh, bank statements from her foster carer and uh, gave them to her father who took them to the judge in court because these bank statements showed that she, this foster carer was getting about £440 a week at that time, it was four or five years ago and out of that it was quite clear 200 went every week to the social worker so there was the evidence and the father presented this to the judge you know, he was trying to get his daughter returned to him the judge was furious he said, this proves that, that, this door, that this girl, you've trained her to be a thief and you are colluding with her and you're not fit to be a father. And that I want this evidence given to me. And he said, I am putting you an order of this court that you should never tell anybody about this. Not anybody at all or you will be in jail as quick as I can put you. Yeah. That, I promise you, I'm not making up, that, that, that happened. But we knew from that one example that it's widespread, that, that in fact they do get commissions from, from agencies who, which are run by, their, by ex-social workers very often. Uh, and then they're sold out to commercial companies who are equally quite friendly about uh, giving commissions. So that's, you know, the, money's, the money angle is one of the reasons. Of course there are other people, I mean the judges, the guardians, the psychologists. Now, some of you may not know there are that the psychologists you, used by the courts very often have no qualifications whatever. Um, how can they do this? Any one of you sitting here could put a notice on your front door and say, I am Annie Smith, I am a top psychologist, I will cure all your mental ills, come to me. No one could stop you. It's not like being a doctor, you, you'd get in jail if you said you were a doctor somebody. If you said you were a psychiatrist, you have to be a doctor first. But a psychologist, there are qualifications, but you don't have to have any. You can just set up as one tomorrow if you want. So if you all like to go home, there'll be a 200 new, new psychologists in the morning. You know, that, 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 that would be quite fun. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, I, I switched this damn thing off. I, Again, um, the rich and the poor, the attack of the middle class. Um, 
I'm very. Uh, 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 yes. What you. Do you know what? what? You sound like a lady who needs to go off and do the bed. Oh, it's so. Uh, uh, like most families, they, they've got nothing. They don't it, know what's going yeah. on. This is why we have to put on confidence. Yeah, what, yeah. You, what, you, what you said earlier was very true, you see, because. They do not want the the, the people uh, do not want baby baby P and and Daniel Pelker and children like that because people don't want to adopt a child that's been beaten up. Uh, those children, as you quite correctly say, are left to die. You get a social worker who's just begun and goes, to, uh, as happens with baby P's mother, goes to goes to a house. And it's smelly. There's a nasty, drunken stepfather uh, there and his mate, two Rottweilers, and they're both dead drunk. She puts that to the bottom of her visiting list after that, you can be sure. You know, and, and, and they, do, they just don't want that. But they still look kindly on those sort of people who beat up their children because Baby P's mother, unlike many mothers who've been stopped seeing their children, Baby P's mother, of course, was after, even after his death and everything, she was allowed to see her surviving children in jail. You know, that, that, so it's, you know, if you're in with the social workers and she cooperated and probably helped them in many ways, they, they, they don't, they, they, they don't look down on her, yeah. Um, what's the socio-economic background of the people who have their children taken? Is it it's mainly mainly poor, I would say, but not necessarily. It's people who look vulnerable, I would say. You know, they want an easy, an easy tar target, which is what I was coming on to anyway. Because um, if you cooperate with them, they'll give you the idea: cooperate with us, and you'll get your children back. It's uh, or we won't take them. It's the exact opposite. They want. They think privately, oh, here's another mug who's going to do everything that we tell them to. We'll soon get their children. This is how I advise people on my site, which is called forcedadoption.com, to, to, to deal with social workers. And that is this. Ignore social workers. They're the dustmen. Don't speak to them. Don't speak to them at all. Don't let them in the house. They have no authority whatever. They can't, uh, they can't demand you ask any questions. Tell your doctor, do not release my medical records. They've no right to see them. Do not uh, tell your children, do not speak to strangers, especially if they're social workers, because they steal children. You've got to tell them the truth and, 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 and deal with them like that. The only thing you should say to a social worker is this, and you should always say this very politely. I'm very sorry, because it costs nothing to apologise. I'm very, very sorry, but I have been advised not to speak to you, so there's the end of it. I'm awfully sorry about that, otherwise I'd love to invite you in. And um, that is all you say. <laughs> I, I, promise, I promise you that's the best thing. And uh, we, we were talking about uh, civil rights a bit earlier, the previous speaker. I'd like to talk about the civil rights of the children they take. Because the worst thing that can happen to a child of five, six, seven, or eight, it's worse than babies. They arrive with, with uniformed police at six or seven in the morning, uh, which is their favorite time, and cart them off screaming for their parents as often as not. Uh, and the first thing that happens to them is they have their mobile phones confiscated, they have their laptops taken away, they are isolated completely from family and friends. <laughs> and then when parents are allowed to go and see them, it's supervised. They mustn't talk about the case. They mustn't uh, show too much emotion. They mustn't talk about coming home. And above all, they must not discuss any abuse they're suffering at the hands of the foster carers. <laughs> I'd, I'd like you to, if you ever talk about this to social workers or other people, make the comparison between... Uh, Peter Sutcliffe, Dr. Shipman, Mylene Hindley, all these serial killers and murderers, when they go to jail, they're allowed to phone out. They don't have their phones confiscated. Well, they have their mobile phones confiscated, but they're allowed to use the phone out to who they want, once oh, a week at least. She's still alive, by the way. Is she? She's hmm. not dead. I thought she was. No, no she's not dead. And I know that from having yeah, on, on top of, on top, on top of that, when visitors come, they can discuss their case and discuss anything they like. So you've got, you've got the fact that children of five, six, seven, or eight are treated worse than the very worst murderers in the country. And how can that be right? Yeah, sorry, yeah.
that John Hurst, the gentleman who axed his landlady to death yeah. uh, 25 years ago, he's won a, a court case in the UK called the rights to allow prisoners, rapists, murderers to have a vote. So they, yeah. um, they're laughing. At the, yeah. uh, as long as you can claim that you're a victim, yeah. then you, you are... Mind you, I can't. I can't see many many prisoners queuing up at the polling booth. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no. He was no. Yes. at the British people. Yeah. And, um, showing that Cameron mm. and the rest of them can do nothing. Mm. Yeah. But I think it's a terrible thing that the way the these children are treated, um, because treated when than the worst murderers and, and serial killers, and the gagging orders. We're supposed to have free speech in this country. Uh, how can you have that if you have a gagging order? All right, you, if you say something, if I say this, that uh, you, you, some of you sang down, ran down Piccadilly Circus, net stark naked singing God Save the Queen, you could sue me for libel, right? Or maybe you'd say it was a good thing, I don't know, but, you, 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 but you're protected. There are laws for that already. And the S Official Secrets Act pr protects people giving away our spies in Russia and places like that. You don't need a gagging order to stop people contacting their own children. Especially, even if somebody's convicted of an offence against children, well, I don't say they should be allowed face-to-face -face contact, but to ban people from sending emails or, or anything like that is pretty far-fetched. When, when you get people jailed who've never committed any crime against a child uh, for waving at them in the street as they won't go past, as one man was jailed for, sending a birthday card, or like Vicky Haig, who I can name because she was named in Parliament, um, uh, she uh, was stopped from seeing her child and she hadn't seen her for two years when a car drove up at a petrol station where she was doing some shopping and in, in the car was the father and her daughter. She went over to say hello and for that she was given a sentence in jail of three years, not three days, three years for speaking to her daughter. No one convicted her of any crime. What she had done was accuse the father of sexual abuse of the daughter. Well, she didn't accuse it. The daughter accused, accused him, went to the police, and the police said, do you believe her? And, and the mother said, yes, that was her crime, because he was an Olympic athlete, and uh, there we are. Anyway, had more. But the point is not the rightness of the case, but of the fact that she was jailed for speaking to her. And then she was later jailed again because her... Uh, her new partner had two children and they wanted to send uh, a, a, a birthday card uh, to this lady's daughter, to Vicky's daughter. And she said, well, I can't write anything. You can write what you like and I'll give it to the vicar and he'll pass it on. He didn't. He passed it to the police and she was jailed for a day just to keep her a lesson. The card never even got sent, but just for giving it to the vicar. So, <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah, I mean, these, these things happen. So then the answer is, I think I've shown a little bit of what's gone wrong and why it's gone wrong. So what can you do to put it right? Now, you know... Um, can I say something here? Yeah. And it's for everybody to know this. Prisoners have every right. They have more rights than kids in care. Oh, for more. They yeah. get their contacts. They can write them storybooks for the kids. They can do phone calls. They get contacts. What has a kid got, and he's not even, he's not even committed a crime, mm. that kid? Yeah. They've got no rights whatsoever. So what Ian is saying is very it's, it's the worst thing. Yeah. But, um, now, Maggie has suggested saying, you know, what we've got to do is march down the street, thousands of people. Well, you know, it makes you feel good, but I don't really agree. I don't think you change the law that way. Um, You've got to do. You've got to say oh, you what can't you want. Sit on Facebook all day long. No, Jeffy no, I, 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 I didn't suggest it, did I? Up well, to what now. Are you going to do? That was exactly what I was going you to tell you. I was. I, I've. I've campaigned, uh, saying definite solutions. I don't. I never believe in any criticism in business or in life unless you've got a better solution. If you haven't, shut up. You can't get and this is. And this is. Well, well, I was trying to tell you. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> uh, this, is the, this is the first thing. You have to campaign for something definite, definite, that has no ambiguity, that can't be misunderstood. And one simple change in the law could do that. And that is to say, to try and get the politicians to pass a law saying that no child can be taken 
from its parents unless a parent has been convicted, not accused, but convicted of a crime against children, a significant one. <laughs> nearly, nearly all the people who, t who, who telephone me, and I get uh, a minimum of two or three a day, and generally mostly a dozen, and two or three of those are always new ones, and then they're follow-up ones. Well, I just give advice by telephone. I don't wave, wave a magic wand, but I do get quite a few people off. Uh, that's children back to them. Um, if this is the case, most of those children would never have been taken. I don't say that everybody who commits a crime should lose their children, and certainly only if they've committed a crime, uh, a serious crime against children. But the vast majority, I'd say 99% of the people who phone me, they've never done anything. Um, the, people who, the people who really beat up children, they don't go to people like me. They don't go to courts. They, they, they never go to the court to a Mrs. Uh, Baby P's mother, certainly didn't, wouldn't have gone to court if he survived and say, give me my darling child. He, he, people like that who beat up children give courts a very wide berth indeed. So this, that is one practical change to the law. They should also abolish gagging orders because we believe in free speech. Um, if you say something bad about someone that isn't true, then they'll sue you. You know, you're protected. In America, the United States, <coughs> that is part of their constitution. So it's no good saying it's not practical. It is, because there's two, three hundred million people who are using it. Yes, sir? In the meantime, I think, uh, this, as you said, people, they take children from are generally vulnerable. Strength in numbers, you know, if we, if we connect up with a community of people, if we were... I think you've got, to con you've got to connect up with the politicians. You know, if, uh, 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 say, 2,000 people walk walking in the street is one thing, but 200 outside the front door of a member of parliament, that's more effective. You, you, I don't say that, that you should just do it by yourself, but, you know, you've got to target the people who can change the law. That is, that is how laws always get changed, in fact. Understanding of the law, I mean, there's a, lack, a real lack of knowledge about the law. And as you said, most people, a lot of people don't even know that you can tell the social workers to... No, they don't. I mean, I, I often, people say, well, I didn't know that. They have no authority. And I'll repeat it again in case people didn't hear it. A social worker has no authority. The man who empties your bins can probably get you fined if you dare put food in where the newspapers are supposed to put. You know, the, a traffic warden, if you park your car in the wrong place, can get you given a ticket. A social worker can't even do that. They have no authority at all. It's all bluff. And nobody should give way to threats. Not, not only about children or from social workers, but threats from anybody about anything. If somebody's got to threaten you, they're not worth talking to. You, 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 people, you either do it or you don't do it. You don't threaten people. You shouldn't. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I was in a hate convention case, and the judge chose okay, to I'll wind up. avoid human rights, all of the Human Rights Act, and he chose to avoid all of the rights of the child, and said that he wasn't actually there yeah. Well, that is that is dead against uh, dead against the top case uh, uh, Neulinger and Shirk, which says that in spite of the Hague Convention, the first the first duty of a judge in the European courts uh, is to look at the welfare of the child where it's best, and that is the Grand Chamber, which is the like the Supreme Court in England. It's the, the Grand Chamber is the, the equivalent in Europe. So I've got to wind up now. Okay, I think you get the idea now that there is a, a lot of money to be made out of children being in care. Now, nobody says that kids shouldn't be in care because certainly there are lots of children who are better off being in care. But I certainly do know of cases where children are in care when they don't need to be in care. In fact, I've got um, two cases that are in the Supreme Court at the moment. One um, involves a mother whose um, baby was adopted recently, aided by, largely, by a fake psychiatric report. And we know it's a fake psychiatric report because the mother um, was interviewed twice by the psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Kolkovitz, and she recorded it. She recorded the assessment, and she's got the reports, and the two don't match up. And we've got a, a psychologist who has um, assessed the mother and doesn't come up with the same diagnosis. But on the back of this fake diagnosis, her son was adopted um, 
about three weeks ago. Her two daughters are in care and um, they're using the same fake psychiatric report to keep these two girls in care until they're 18. So that's another 10 years, all avoidably, all at public expense. And this quite often happens when local authorities make mistakes with children in care. Something goes wrong and they want to cover it up, so they keep them in care at public expense. I've got the other case that's in the Supreme Court that involves Desmond Tutu's grandson. Again, um, he wasn't British, he didn't want to stay here, he wanted to leave the country, he was visiting the country, and he was in care for a year. All at public expense. No jurisdiction, all at public expense. So that's just two cases, and those are two cases that I've got that are in the Supreme Court currently. So how many more cases are there of kids being in care, forcibly separated, forcibly adopted, for no good reason, other than the fact somebody wants them to be adopted and kept in care, and somebody wants to earn money out of them or, or, or a favour. That is what is shocking, and I think it's pure evil to uh, do that to a, to a mother, you know, a, a good mother, take a, take a child from a good mother and keep, keep the child from a good mother. I'm going to move on from there to uh, my next slide, which is uh, the case of Maureen Spalick.
Now, Maureen, I've known since 2000, 2003. I was introduced to her by a lady called Sharon Kilby, um, who thought we had similar experiences with Freemason husbands. And, and she was right. We, we had a lot of similarities. Maureen was in Liverpool, but I was down here. And uh, Sharon was a good friend to us for many years, but like many people who come into our lives, they get bought and they turn against us. So if you look on the internet and look at the Sharon Kilby website, you'll suddenly find that she's anti both myself and Maureen. But that's quite typical of what happens in scandals and people who know too much is that people change sides and whatever. But Maureen's situation is, is a scandal um, because her husband, uh, Ray Spalick, is a high-ranking Freemason, naval officer, and what happened to her children is, is what he threatened would happen. And um, when you look at the circumstances of this, um, then you, you think, this is disgusting, as to the fact it's actually gone on, that this woman could actually lose her three children. Um, one of them was Ray Spalick's child and the other two were somebody else's but all three of them went the old elder one that was raised Balix went went to live with him and the two younger ones were adopted and um, the mother um, has suffered similar to me for many 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 years um, she would have been here tonight but she's nursing she's in Liverpool nursing her, her aging mother so she wishes us all the best for tonight but her problems haven't finished um, at all. This year she's being threatened with MASH. She's getting harassment from police and neighbours and all sorts of things. You know, because she won't stop speaking. She loves her children. She wants her children back. And um, she won't stop opening her mouth about her children and that they were stolen from her for all the wrong reasons. Back in 2003, Maureen had, uh, her three children were quite, quite young. She had uh, a boy of four, a girl of two, and a baby. And she went into a Liverpool park with the three children, one of whom was in the buggy, and with the family dog. They were walking in the park when all of a sudden, in the park, where no vehicles were allowed, a motorbike appeared. And then Maureen became aware that the motorbike was heading towards the group of them and that somebody was going to get injured. Well, that's what happened. Um, her oldest child, Sean, was injured and um, had a broken leg, amongst other things. This was a Friday, a Friday afternoon, and Sean was taken to the Alder Hay Hospital in, in Liverpool. Meanwhile, um, the younger two children uh, went home to be looked after by their grandmother and aunt. From the Friday afternoon to the Monday, in that short space of time, Maureen had lost all three of her children. Um, there were false allegations made against her in the hospital, alleging that she'd been sectioned in the past and that whatever, um, by women working on the ward. <coughs> and uh, while Maureen was up at the hospital on the uh, Monday morning, after he'd been in there on the Friday, the police turned up at her home, where the two younger ones were, living, were with the grandmother and the aunt, and they snatched both the children, both the younger children. And they were adopted. I worked with her on that case for, for many years and um, there's quite a scandal about it, but there is no doubt that her kids were taken off of her for a Freemason favour. No basis for um, the kids being removed from her. That's quite shocking when you think that can happen in this country, that people can um, do favours and um, you can have your kids taken off of you. And then later on, when we come, come to it, we're going to see the same thing is still happening today because it happened in the Desmond Tutu case too. 
but very, very frightening that, that in this country, a, a good mother, a good parent can lose a child for all the wrong reasons. Nobody's saying they shouldn't be taken if there's a need for them to be taken, but not, as Ian Joseph says, on the basis of future emotional harm. So many children are, are being taken on the basis of future emotional harm and adopted on the basis of future emotional harm. How do you quantify that? It's a problem. So, I mean, all of this is at taxpayers' expense. Very sad. Right, uh, let's now talk about avoidable repossessions in Maidstone. Well, we, we had this a saga whereby uh, BMI, Mason County Court, wanted both my properties. Well, in the end, they both went. Avoidable repossessions, um, they, they went. And um, I've got a crime reference on the second one because I've never got any of the proceeds of sale back. But basically, what was going on about in the early 2003, 4, 5, around that time, was that um, mortgage lenders and banks had cash flow problems. You may remember the, the financial crisis that we had. They had cash flow problems. And under normal business activity, um, lending money and people paying mortgages, they don't earn an awful lot of money. But when it comes to a repossession, wow, they can earn a lot of money under repossessions because when they repossess, they take as much of your money as they want, not just what you owe them, they take a lot more. In my case, on one of my properties, they took an extra 150,000, and on the other one, I lost the whole lot. So, um, and I didn't have a mortgage on that one. Um, so that's where money can be, money was earned out of repossessions for the mortgage lenders that had cash flow problems. They were being reckless with their cash. Lots of banks, as we know, and mortgage lenders had cash flow problems. Around that time, I was in and out the Maystone County Court, and people used to tell me a lot of things. And um, they were doing up to 20 a day, at, at that stage, avoidable repossessions down the Maystone County Court. And what happens to all these homeless families? Who looks after them at public expense? While the uh, avoidable repossession and the money's going into the bank and the mortgage lender who've been reckless with their money and got cash flow problems, what a great service the Maystone County Court do. You know, these reckless big businesses need some cash. So, okay, let's repossess a few people locally. And then we'll put them up at public expense, break up a few families, put a few in care, Kids on the streets, wonderful, wonderful service offered in Maidstone. I'm now going to um, show you two videos that are off the internet about a Maidstone businessman and what he says about his avoidable repossessions. Nice, isn't it? This has been our family home for 26 years. Now we stand to lose it to a paedophile. I'm Terry Armstrong. Let me explain. I've got a favourite aunt. Haven't we all? Aunt Lily. Yeah, this is the Bancroft Estate in London's East End. This is where my aunt Lily and Uncle Larry used to live until 1993. One day Lily called me, have you been caught flashing local kids? The police brought him here, Arbor Square Nick. Didn't stop the locals beating him up though, and Lily. Now she had to get out of the East End, so um, I said I'd help, for her sake. It just so happened my father-in-law had just died. My mother-in-law wanted to sell a house in Lenham by a bungalow. So I helped do a deal between them to keep Lily safe. They were happy here for about 10 years until on the 7th of June, 2001, my aunt Lily died. She'd been bedridden, so she got all sorts of disability benefits, mobility car. Of course, when she died, all that stopped. They even took back the car. 
while she was alive, she looked after the housekeeping, paid all the bills and that. Harry, not exactly your academic, started to panic about keeping a roof over his head. We bought him a car to cheer him up. It ended up with him asking my boy to buy the house. He wanted the boy to assume all the responsibility as long as he could live there rent free for the rest of his life. Obviously, we had to think about that because the sort of bloke Uncle Larry was. But as far as we knew, he hadn't been in trouble for 10 years. He was in his 70s. House had been in the family for years, Mum had had it. Seemed like a good deal for both of them. To make sure everything was above board and proper, we've got Uncle Larry a solicitor. So he had independent legal advice. He used this firm, Dundas and Juice in Maystone. As it turned out, the advice Harry was given was later described by three High Court judges as, amongst other things, sadly lacking, grossly inadequate, dire and negligent. We invited Colin Deuce to take part in this film, but he declined. The deal was done, but there was no way my boy could move in. The place was a right mess. Harry had two dogs who shit everywhere. The carpets were rotten. We had to clean it up. The boy had double glazing put in, the curb lowered. Anything Harry wanted done, he just picked up the phone, called him, and my kid done it. Anyway, Harry lived here for about 18 months. No problem. In October 2002, Uncle Larry called my boy and said the neighbours were moaning about the height of the hedge in the back garden. A few days later, we had some time, threw a few tools in the car, came round here to do it. When, when we got there, we went down the side entrance and straight round the back. Boy started on the edge, and I built bomb for her. Um, you, you never went in the house unless it was absolutely necessary. But while we were there, I needed to nip upstairs and use the loo. I found a pile of old newspapers on the landing. Figured I'd throw them on the fire. Thought I'd have a scout about and see what other rubbish I could find. The door was open, so I went into Harry's bedroom. On, on the bed there was a hat box. Photos, drawings. When I got a closer look, I realised they were porno photos of kids, some with men and kids. Bad enough, I recognised Harry's five year old granddaughter and him, naked, with another bloke. I mean, you don't want to see it. You, you never want to see it. I lost it. I stormed down the stairs to front Harry. My kids thought I'd hurt him. So they dragged me out to the car. And we left. Turns out he was exposing himself to the kids in the village as well. Same thing happened as in the East End. Neighbours attacked the house, his car. So he legged it. All we hadn't counted on was how was he going to tell his daughter why he had left the house? Because obviously it was her daughter he was abusing. Told the police, social services, heard nothing. But we will. Blokes like Harry don't ever stop. The story Uncle Harry told his daughter was that my boy had chucked him out of the house because he wanted to move in. 
so she brought him here. Local solicitor, Kingsford's in Ashford. They got him legal aid. Then they took high court action against us. It seems Harry was claiming he was bullied into selling the house. But now he'd done a runner from the house. He wasn't interested in the house anymore. He wanted money. We invited Kevin Harper of Kingsford to take part in this film, but he declined. My boy wrote to his building society, the Halifax, several times to tell him what was happening, what the courts were doing, why the house was empty, why he couldn't go back there. He asked them for some help. They just blanked him. He couldn't understand it. We found out why during the trial. It seems the Halifax PLC had done a backdoor deal with a paedophile to save money. It seems that cash is more important to these people than kids. We invited the Halifax PLC through their solicitors, Reese Page, to take part in this film, but they declined. Thompson, Snell and Passmore were our solicitors. But all they kept saying was, pay him. How do you sleep at night knowing you paid a paedophile? Could you? One minute they're saying, you've got a good case. The next they're saying, but he's got legal aid, so even if you win, you lose. Cheaper to pay it. We fell out with our solicitors. You know what they did? They sacked us. And now they're suing us too. They left us high and dry with no legal representation, weeks away from the trial. We applied to the court to stop them from sacking us and asked Harry's solicitors if we could have an adjournment to give us time to sort ourselves out. Of course, Harry said no. And unbelievably, the High Court somehow lost our papers. So there we were, no paperwork, no lawyers, and no choice but to represent ourselves. You try defending yourself against a load of blokes in wigs, Batman clothes, and speaking Latin. We got well and truly shafted by the law. My son lost his house, which was sold off by the Halifax PLC to pay off the paedophile. And now I'm about to lose my house to pay his legal costs. We invited John Spence of Thompson Spinner Passmore to take part in this film, but he declined. That speaks for itself, doesn't it? Um, certainly, the reason I, I've always had so much Mackenzie friend work is people don't come to me directly. They go to solicitors first. And um, because they get shafted by solicitors and solicitors let them down, they then come on to me. And um, that's how I've ended up in the, high, in the Supreme Court with two cases with me being a Mackenzie friend. But I think that speaks for itself. And I think you'll enjoy seeing the second part too. Our new solicitors that representing us applied for legal aid for us so we could um, appeal against this summary judgment. And while they were looking at that, they looked at the bills that we've been sent by TSP and they found no less than 88 points of overcharging and delaying tactics. Um, for example, we would be charged we were being charged top dollar solicitor rates for photocopying. That's a lot of money, a job that's normally done by an office junior. Just our luck. Legal Aid took so long to grant the money, the ticket, to our solicitors so they'd get paid to do it, that they had no time to prepare for disclosure the list of 88 points for overcharging and delaying tactics, which meant they didn't disclose it to the court until the morning of the hearing. The, uh, the judge 
wanted written proof from TSMP that they'd given us advice that we couldn't win against um, Mr. Val's claim. Eventually, TSMP came up with 105 documents to prove that they'd given us uh, written advice. But the judge wasn't having none of it because it just wasn't there. There wasn't no written advice. It looked like the judge was going to reject their evidence because they just didn't have it. Amazingly, the counsel that they used for us on the trial, a fella called Waterworth from 10 Old Square Chambers, said in his written statement, which the judge was like, amazed at, he wasn't asked to give an opinion, so he didn't. There was a problem. So what the other side did, their counsel complained that because our counsel had changed the direction of our um, objecting to the summary judgment, it was tantamount to being ambushed. <clears throat> now the only thing they could do was to try to stop, this obviously was going the wrong way you see, so all they, all they could do was <coughs> start to scream that all the money they spent preparing a case for the other kind of direction <coughs> was wasted. So they said to the judge that they think they should get the money that they've wasted and they call it throwaway costs if this was going to go any further. Now this gave the judge a way of letting them off the hook basically because they came up with, with like they wanted 10 grand. So Lightman said, I'll tell you what, we'll recess and then the Armstrongs can show proof that they've got the 10 grand and pay it into the court in which case then I could grant them leave to appeal. So we were on legal aid. Where were we going to get 10 grand in 10 minutes? Impossible. Nonetheless, phone, frantic phone calls, family, friends, we got the 10 grand or promise of 10 grand. So we were able to tell our bloke, tell him yes, we've got 10 grand. Which, we, which he did. Then, from 10 grand, they decided, no, 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 that's not enough. 27 grand they wanted. 27. And if we didn't put that into the court, we'd lose the day. Our counsel, thank God, argued it down to 20 grand. More frantic phone calls. You see, if we couldn't get this money, the judge knew well that, that was the end of it, it would die. But we came back with a fax from a friend to say the 20 grand would be paid in the court within the month. So you see the judge, as much as he tried to help Thompson, Snell and Passmore, was stuck. He had no choice but to grant us leave to appeal. But that's always providing this 20 grand was lodged in the court within 28 days. Everybody on our side was well pleased, all the family and friends thought, thank God for that, we're going to get, them, we're going to get a chance to appeal. Would you believe it? At three o'clock in the afternoon, the day before the trial, our solicitor called us to say that Thompson, Snell and Passmore had conceded, but they didn't want to go to court. So our solicitor advised us that basically, TSMP wanted to mediate our loss. In other words, come to a deal to pay us out of court damages. Our solicitors told us that if we reject mediation and elect to go to court to go to trial, the judge would frown on it because there was a chance here to be reasonable and try to resolve the situation. So a date was set for the uh, 13th of November 2007. At that mediation session, which lasted for oh, 11 o'clock at night, um, it was conceded that they had not given us uh, correct advice and that they would have to pay us out of court damages. It just really got to the point of how much. Um, turns out, in law, that we couldn't claim for the fact that Jason lost his house, that Halifax had repossessed it outside of the um, code of practice, Bow Building Society code of practice, couldn't claim for that. 
We couldn't claim for loss of business and bearing in mind we lost apps an absolute fortune because our business crashed on the back of all the publicity that this generated. All we could claim for was basically what TSMP, a firm of solicitors, had charged us. Yes, there's another couple of firms that we've got to go after, but all we could get back was the fraudulent charges that they had made upon us. We weren't best pleased with that because we'd lost a lot of money, but our legal team urged us to accept what was on the table because they said if we didn't take their advice and accept a paltry offer, we probably would lose legal aid, which in effect meant that if we elected to go to trial, we'd have to defend ourselves again. And we know what happened last time because we're no match for these barristers. So we had no choice, no option, but to accept it peanuts on the day. We weren't best pleased at all with this. There was no money really because after repaying our legal aid bill, and you do have to pay the legal aid back if you, if you use your legal aid, the money that TSMP paid for us in damages wasn't even enough to pay off Uncle Harry's le uh, legal cost, for which he's got a court order. So under his court order, if we don't pay his solicitor's top-up costs, our house will have to be sold to pay it because they've got this order. And our only recourse is to go public with the whole sorry story so that other people are warned not to assume that just because it's an old established firm of solicitors they can be trusted just like Thompson Snell their main target is profit we've been we now know from other people that all they do is charge you max they screw you which is exactly what they did to us My name's Kerry Armstrong. Right. Please, don't let us Thank stop. Thank you. Please. <laughs> I'm a television producer. Right. Here's my card. Thank you. And currently we're making a documentary about Thompson Snell. Oh, right. Um, I'm, I'm an old client. Right. This year's right. got Thompson Snell Passmore. Right. And the documentary Easy. is going to focus on Thompson Snell right. Passmore's negligence. And my, my family is about to lose his house. It's going to be repossessed. So, could you please take that, right. read it, and then pass it on to Michael, please? Right, okay, I'll do that for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Very interesting, isn't it? Um, now, if I go, if I talk a little bit more about what I know about solicitors in Maidstone, um, I was fortunate that I had a client up at my business in Lordswood who ran a first aid business, or still runs a first aid supplies business in Canterbury and is also uh, by profession an accountant. This chap um, is a, a Freemason, a, a decent Freemason. And he opposed the um, selling of the Royal Masonic Hospital, which I believe was a forerunner to bringing down the NHS. And he suffered reprisals, and he also had a um, um, business in Snodland whereby uh, he was giving out cheaper mortgages than anyone else. And this business got taken down by fellow Masons in Kent. And one of the reprisals he had for speaking out about the Royal Masonic Hospital was, again, a fake bankruptcy. Not a very good thing for an accountant, but he was a fake bankrupt. Anyway, he, it, we spent a lot of time talking, um, Malcolm and I, um, daily for about two or three years, um, so that we were educating each other because we seemed to have people in common that were bringing down each other's businesses and affecting our lives and our experiences were very similar. And... Um, we, we did quite a lot to try and flush things out in the open. But what he told me about solicitors in Maidstone was quite interesting. Because he told me that the solicitors in Maidstone <clears throat> meet once a week and that they discuss what cases they've got 
And if somebody wants to earn an extra fee out of stuffing their own client, that's what can happen. Yep. Does anyone wonder why you don't trust solicitors? I mean, certainly from my own experience, it became blatantly obvious wherever I went around the UK after I got driven out of Maystone, that um, somebody has to, somebody can instruct the Law Society and what they will do is the Law Society will instruct their members up and down the country either not to take your case on or if they take it, to sabotage it. And I've just seen this happen um, in the Tutu case. Um, I was working on that case since last July, uh, working with the mother every single day. In the end, she sacked four solicitors. Eventually, she got four solicitors out of legal aid and in the end, she gave up because it was blatantly obvious that something was happening in her case. Um, and I've got all the filmed videos. Um, I, I did some interviews with the mother and, and the son, which really explain in detail what these solicitors and some of the biggest name barristers you, you would know in the country got up to in that case. It's quite shocking. Um, so that is the sort of stuff that actually goes on in this country. With my own avoidable repossessions, I had two mortgage protection policies. Neither of them would pay up. I also found I had other policies like um, legal protection on car accidents and um, policies in the home. None of them would pay up. So now, I, unless I have to have insurance, I don't bother because what's the point if they don't pay up and it's optional? But certainly none of my uh, mortgage neither of my mortgage protection paid up. And the story with my, my um, two properties was that they were both um, had a mortgage with Alliance and Leicester home loans. I didn't twig initially, I just thought it was something that I could do, have both my farmhouse and my office block <coughs> with Alliance and Leicester home loans, which of course you can't. So my main, the biggest mortgage I had was actually my office block, but they put it on my home. And uh, so I had two mortgages on my home, the office block and my home. And they were both with NatWest Home Loans, even though it was a buy-to-let mortgage in Lawswood. In the end, because of all the harassment at my home over this um, privatisation of the NHS from Maidstone, I had to um, remortgage £15,000 to upgrade the security at my home. I had bollards put in, um, CCTV, whatever, uh, to protect my home from those that were trying to take it off of me and trying to terrorise me. So, you know, that was um, my third mortgage. I mean, the other day I drove past Councillor Sheila Williams's home and her home reminded me of mine. It looks like a fortress and that's what mine looked like. Um, back in 2005, it looked like a fortress because I was terrified of what was going on and trying to protect myself and my children. But um, at the time they repossessed my, my farmhouse and it was repossessed for the evidence. I spent five years carefully getting witness statements from everybody as to what was going on. Um, my, my home was repossessed for the evidence that was in it because at the time they repossessed it, I didn't owe anything because basically the mortgage payments were voidable because they were illegal. The Alliance and Leicester never had the legal authority to lend me money on my biggest mortgage, which was the buy to let. It was a home loan um, and it was a buy to let. So they, it was voidable. So they actually owed me money. But they were determined, and the Maystone County Court, they, they turned up in force with sledgehammers and um, smashed their way in, seized all the evidence. And then after we got thrown out, somebody wrote on the door, um, well, it's rude actually, but something really rude on the door. I'm not gonna say it. But um, that was to get me onto the streets um, as, as a means of um, trying to get me sectioned. Um, anyway, I ended up leaving Maidstone and going up to Carlisle. In, in April last year, a 15-year-old boy and his mother, who's got a PhD, flew in from their former home in Switzerland into London for a few days' holiday before they travelled on to their home in Zimbabwe. They stayed with relatives in the London borough of Sutton. 
Unfortunately, in May last year, the teenager went into care in the London Borough of Sutton. He was 15. His passports are Zimbabwean, Canadian, um, and he didn't want to live in the UK. And basically, in order to keep him in the UK, the courts kept saying, we have jurisdiction because the boy was not habitually resident anywhere at the time he was on holiday in London. Well, he was resident in two countries. He just finished residency in Switzerland and he was moving back to his permanent home in Zimbabwe. But this stupid excuse went all the way through the courts and all the way up into the Court of Appeal, that we have jurisdiction to keep this foreign kid in this country. And what they were actually doing is changing the law on foreign kids coming in via the back door without referring it to Parliament. Because um, under the Hague Convention, they have no right to keep the kid. And what happened to the kid in care is disgusting. And when children are 16 in this country, they can actually leave care themselves. But in this boy's situation, they were so keen to keep him, they kept applying to the Home Office to extend his visa, and they were going to um, try and keep him until he was 18. They wanted to cut all ties with his family and send him to live in Newcastle. That was the plan for him. He um, had horrible things happen to him in care, as a consequence of which he had PTSD. Um, that was never treated, but instead, to cover up for the breach of duty of care and what had happened to him in care, he was sectioned um, on the 4th of February this year and sent to a secure mental hospital. The mother managed to um, persuade a, a judge to have a hearing at which the judge ordered that the boy would be brought down from the mental hospital for the hearing. The hearing was due to be on the uh, 5th of April in the High Court. Mr Justice MacDonald was the judge. By that stage, the boy had been in care for nearly a year, still desperate to get out of the country, didn't want to stay here, but they were absolutely determined they wanted to keep him here at great public expense. Two care workers from the mental hospital brought him down to the Royal Courts of Justice. When he got to the Royal Courts of Justice, he thought, I can't take any more of the injustice going on in the courts. I've had enough. I'm not going in that courtroom. And what he did, he legged it out of the Royal Courts of Justice, ran down the Strand into the Zimbabwe Embassy. And that's where he went, asked for asylum um, on the 5th of April. Even though they were, he was in there and trying to get help to leave the country, they were serving orders on him to, to get him out. They were demanding that the mother, uh, they served a collection order on, on the mother in the embassy saying, you have to give him back to us. And if you don't give him back to us, you're going to prison. Yeah? So while he was in the embassy, um, we made a few videos. I've got videos at home um, of me interviewing the boy and the mother. And we've got very detailed information about what was going on in the court case and how solicitors and barristers, very well known ones, were actually undermining things. Um, so this uh, video I'm about to show you happened while he was in the Zimbabwe embassy. And um, I was a last minute speaker on the 23rd of April uh, about him in the Zimbabwe Embassy. And my summary of the situation is, shows the illegality of, of him actually even being in care in the first place. But the, poor, the boy, unfortunately, is, is an embarrassment to his grandfather, Desmond Tutu. He, his mother is a very high profile world businesswoman, and she's caused embarrassment to the Tutus around the world She's been on Canadian TV. She's been in the South African courts. Um, the boy's father is Trevor Tutu. She was, at the time he was taken into care, there was actually a court case going on at the same time in South Africa. And what was happening in South Africa was that the mother was suing Trevor Tutu for all the 15 years of child maintenance that she'd never had. 
and there was articles in the papers about Tutu getting favours because of who he is and, and, and all that sort of thing. Anyway, the, under South African law, if um, a, a parent like Trevor Tutu doesn't pay maintenance for a child, then it is the grandparents, Desmond Tutu and his wife Leah, who are responsible for those 15 years. Well, magically, once the boy got taken into care, the case got dropped in South Africa, and the boy spent a year in care before he actually escaped. I don't know how they did it, but they were in 21 days in the embassy doing a Julian Assange, and Julian Assange has been there nearly four years, but how they got out, there were police outside and a police station opposite Charing Cross, how, that, how they actually escaped, but they did, and they escaped across nine countries to get back to Zimbabwe. But um, I'll now show you the video, which is evidence of the fact that they, he, the whole year was a complete and utter waste of money, a massive child protection scandal, um, because if they can do that to him, who else can they do it to in the London Borough of Sutton? me throughout the day make references to a Zimbabwean boy who is in care, who is currently holed up in the Zimbabwe Embassy in London. Um, as Maggie rightly says, he's actually Desmond Tutu's grandson. The boy and his mother have been in the embassy living there in one small room since the 5th of April. And basically what happened in that situation is that the boy who was in a mental hospital, having been sectioned, um, was taken to the Royal Courts of Justice by two support workers from the mental hospital, and he was due to attend a hearing uh, before Mr Justice MacDonald on the 5th of April. When he got to court, he thought, I've had enough of this, 11 months, I've been going through the court system, I don't believe they're listening to me. I don't believe I can get justice. So what he decided to do was leg it. And he ran out of the Royal Courts of Justice. He went down the Strand. He stopped a passerby. He had no mobile phone because he'd been, all of that had been taken off of him. He stopped a passerby outside the Zimbabwe Embassy and said, please can I phone my mum? So he rang his mum and said, I'm going into the Embassy to seek refuge and to get help. So that's what he did. He went into the embassy to seek refuge and to get help. And his mother followed him into the embassy and there they remain. Um, both the mother and the son are whistleblowers. Both of them have done, they're not British. Um, in fact, the mother claims and has claimed throughout that there is no jurisdiction for uh, anything to be done in relation to her son, that he shouldn't be in care, <coughs> that there's no jurisdiction for the courts, uh, but they can't seem to get anybody to listen to them. Um, the courts consistently say, under Article 6.2 of the Hague Convention 1996, we've got jurisdiction. Uh, they say that the boy, who was a tourist in London last year, um, <coughs> was not habitually <coughs> resident anywhere wh when he was. So um, the, pair, the, the mother claims that he's therefore been illegally in care and legally going through the court system at great public expense uh, without any jurisdiction. So that in itself is a problem. The, they also claim that the, thre the threshold hasn't been met either, but what this couple have done, because they're both whistleblowers, and they've been trying to expose what's been going on in the court system since they've been here in the UK. So what they've done, or a relative has done, is set up a website to help everybody in this country going through the family court system. And the website is not in this jurisdiction. It's overseas. And it's got documents and videos um, and evidence as to what goes on in the court system over here that any of you can use in your own court cases, in your own court actions. 
the website address if you'd like to take it down. I'll give you an illustration of the sort of things that are on it, um, but the website address is www foreign kids snatched by UK dot com foreign kids snatched by UK dot com and I'll if I just quote from an email that the mother sent to me two days ago um, she wrote dear Yolandi thank you very much for your great effort and then uh, she was copying something in that I'd <coughs> written to the Supreme Court I'll explain what that is in a moment but she says, we had to let go of our legal aid solicitors because they were representing the interests of the establishment instead of our interests. And the evidence of this, four sets of solicitors and barristers that the mother had, she had to let them all go. And the boy had to do the same. In fact, the boy, who's 16, tried to sack his solicitor three times but the judge refused to let him sack his own solicitor. Um, but the situation um, progressed yesterday in that there was a hearing yesterday to discuss whether the boy could sack his solicitor, amongst other things, and whether he could go home. He wants to go home. He doesn't want to be a burden to the taxpayer. He wants to leave the country as soon as possible and go home to Zimbabwe. Anyway, there was a hearing yesterday afternoon uh, via video link from the Royal Courts of Justice, Mr Justice MacDonald, to the Zimbabwe Embassy, where the boy was speaking to the judge. And the boy um, has recorded the hearing. So we've got a good video of Mr Justice MacDonald in action, the boy's social worker, the boy's social worker manager, the solicitor that he's been trying to sack, the barrister that he's been trying to sack, all there in the court. And on this website, we have, we have that video of what happened in the court yesterday. Now, the boy thought, OK, um, it was Mr Justice Cobb last year who said the boy should have his own solicitor because there was a conflict of interest with the Kafka solicitor. So they said, right, the boy should have his own solicitor. Yesterday, his own solicitor um, and barrister stood up in court and said to Mr Justice MacDonald that now we're stepping down, you should have... Um, he should go back to the Kafka solicitor. So that's what the judge ordered. Yeah? Now it's not. And what actually happened was John Hemming, who has been helping in this case um, all this week, had actually... Uh, written to the judge the day before, yesterday, and put his CV in to be the boy's Mackenzie friend. But he was rejected. Yeah? John Hemming was rejected. And this was after John Hemming uh, had on Monday been in the media twice in regard to this case. He was being interviewed on Good Morning Breakfast on Monday morning in relation to this other high-profile celebrity whose name we're not allowed to know, but we all know who it is. And in relation to being interviewed about this other celebrity, he then brought in the Tutu case and said, oh, there's another case going on that's very similar to this because the boy and his mother have got a celebrity media injunction on them. Uh, not only have they got a celebrity media injunction on them, they've got, the mother's got a document restriction order on her. She's not allowed to know anything that's going on in the court proceedings. Um, and that, that um, is, is what's going on. So in the morning, we had John Hemming linking the high-profile um, case involving the celebrity that we all know. Which isn't Tom Jones. No. But he's another one. It's not Tom Jones, no. I'm, I know it is, but I mean, I'm not going to say it on, on this thing. But uh, basically, he, he did link the two cases and said there's, there's somebody doing a, a Julian Assange in the Zimbabwe embassy. And then later on in the day, he went on to uh, BBC Radio Ulster and said more about the situation, linked the two cases again, and um, spoke about 
public money being wasted and it being in the public interest to know what's been going on in this case because of the basic situation. Many horrific things have happened. Uh, the boy last August uh, ended up in hospital after his drink was spiked. He was then moved from Suffolk to a children's home in Barking where he got, he got stabbed. Uh, we went out for the day with somebody in the children's home and he got stabbed. His aunt, who is a psychiatric nurse in um, Zimbabwe, became very concerned. A month later, he was showing signs of PTSD. So pleading, 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 the family were, with a local authority, please, please get this boy help. He's showing all the signs of, of this. What do they do? Ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. Breach of duty of care. Yeah? Breach of duty of care. So this went on and on and on until the 4th of February when he got sectioned, um, largely on the directions of the Director of Social Services. <coughs> so um, he got sectioned. And whilst he was being sectioned, uh, and he was never, ever treated for PTSD. In fact, they diagnosed something completely different. Yeah? <coughs> So, I mean, that, that's a bit of the bottom line of, of what... But also, he was, they were trying to say that he was gay. His solicitor was trying to say to him, oh, tell them that you're gay, you know, and things like that. And he's, he's alleging that his social worker was saying the same thing. So th there's a lot of stuff that's been going on. I mean, there isn't time for me to tell you all of it um, because it's such a big story. But I can tell you that on Thursday morning, when they were hearing this celebrity media in injunction situation, I did write to the Supreme Court on behalf of the boy and his mother. Um, I followed up what John Hemming had done on Monday. So I, I used it as an opportunity to um, deal with other issues and things that, that could help other people. So. I wrote, um, urgent, celebrity media restriction orders, PJS and Desmond Tutu. And you can get a copy of this on that website I told you about. Please can this email be placed before the law laws here in the above PJS case at 9.30 today. In the media, the PJS <coughs> case being heard this morning has been linked to the case of Desmond Tutu's grandson. Please see email of yesterday morning to all London borough of X, <laughs> C. Terence, uh, councillors, etc. Um, I've been a Mackenzie friend to, to Dr. Whatever since last July and out of necessity to her son too, ever since he ran away from a Royal Courts of Justice hearing before Mr. Justice MacDonald on the 5th of April 2016 to seek refuge in the Zimbabwe Embassy, where he was joined by his mother. They've been living there ever since. I'm the person interviewing both Dr. Watson and her son in the two Skype videos, links on the website. There's four videos that you can use on that website. Two of them are me interviewing the mother and the son, and two of them are the mother and I speaking in depth about all, the, all, all that's been going on in all the court cases. So busting the whole thing wide open. Is that to include that letter as well they can read? Yeah, that's on, oh, that's on there. We've got to close at six. Okay. Sorry, we've okay. behind an hour all day. Very sad can, can I just read what the, the, this morning when the, the conference was going on, I was texting the boy and I, I let him know what was going on here and I said to him, have you got a message that you'd like to give to the audience here today, and so I'm now going to read you his words. And his words were, please help me and my mum get out of this country. And then 20 minutes later, he said, please, we're really depressed today, we need uplifting. So I urge you all to go on the website, you can message them from there. This needs to come out. This, th 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 what is in this document you need to read that's on the internet, because like, like the other case is coming out because two million people know about it, we need that sort of thing because these people are whistleblowers, they've done it, they're not from this country, they've been treated appallingly 
and illegally, he's in care illegally, and they're still trying to, they're telling him now that unless he gets himself psychiatrically assessed, he's not allowed to leave the country, and they're saying the mother is at risk of prison because there's a collections order that she's in breach of because she won't push him out the embassy to go back into a mental hospital to be abused. <coughs> the actual diagnosis he had in this mental hospital was schizophrenia. Um, now he's back in Zimbabwe, he's been treated for PTSD and has gone back to school. Um, but um, the mother did flee the country. Uh, don't know how she got out but she did and went through nine countries to get back to Zimbabwe. But whoever got her out, um, part of the deal must have been to have a go at those of us that helped us because that's what she did. And her website is now up there, but all the stuff's been removed. Um, but that case is still in, in the uh, Supreme Court because what they did, the London Borough of Sutton on behalf of themselves and Desmond Tutu, is they got a media uh, reporting restriction order so that no press or media can report this child protection scandal. So that's how I got that into the Supreme Court. Um, and I'm now gonna move on to, to what is the last section um, about uh, injunctions in the High Court and how they're used to rig elections. We're on to the last section here which is the use of injunctions and sectioning and I, what I've said is rigging elections in Maidstone and in the London borough of Sutton. The impact of the Tutu injunction um, means that this child protection scandal of, of gross waste of public money that's in the public interest is being kept a secret from the voters. They're not allowed to know about all this money that's been wasted on this boy being in care, doing a favour. So what, what I'm doing in the High Court, uh, Supreme Court, is getting the reporting restriction order removed so that the voters do know what's going on, that the Director of Children's Services ordered the boy to be sectioned um, to thwart all claims against themselves and negative publicity. What I'm also doing in the Supreme Court is linking the um, reporting injunction against the London Borough of Sutton to what happened to me to stop me from standing uh, against Helen Grant in the 2007 general election. Anne Widdicombe, uh, MP, went to the High Court and got a injunction, two-year injunction plus penal notice against me as part of a process to stop me from standing against Helen Grant in 2007. Basically, I've been trying for 11 years to stand as a um, prospective parliamentary candidate in Maidstone. I was stopped in 2005. I was driven out of Maidstone. I ended up in Carlisle. I thought, okay, if I'm up there, I, I, perhaps I'll have a peaceful life. Well, it didn't happen. Um, and when I was up there in 2007, I travelled down to the Royal Courts of Justice and I had an appointment to see Helene Newman, who at that time was the Royal Courts of Justice Elections Complaints Officer. So I had a meeting with Helene. I said, Helene, what can I do to ensure that I can stand as a respective parliamentary candidate in the 2010 election. She told me, the advice she gave me was to start a defamation action against Anne Widdicombe MP and the Carlisle News and Star. So I followed the advice and I started defamation proceedings against both of them in the Queen's Bench that day. It was the 20th of August, 2007. Unfortunately, um, an injunction ended up being in place. The reason that I went for a defamation was because I had read in the Carlisle News and Star that Anne Widdicombe had contacted FTAC, which is a, a Metropolitan Police Unit that monitors your communications um, because you're an alleged stalker. Well, I, I could hardly be stalking Anne Whittaker when I was 400 miles away up in Carlisle. 
And when I read in the Carlisle News and Star that she was getting all my communications monitored by this FTAC unit, I rang up her constituency office in Maidstone and spoke to her researcher. And I said, um, I asked him about this and he said, don't know anything about it. Don't know that she's got a problem. Uh, don't know any need for her to have uh, your communications monitored. So <clears throat> anyway, um, the impact of the injunction was I had money owing to me, for example, via the Alliance and Leicester. I needed money in order to um, be able to stand as a prospective parliamentary candidate. But with the injunction, I couldn't, couldn't get any of my claims or access to anything that I needed. In the end, I, I came back down south. I missed my kids and I came back down south to live in Sussex. I was too frightened to live in Kent again because I knew that, that if I came south, there would be reprisals. There were reprisals and um, basically, I did get section to stop me standing as a respective parliamentary candidate in Maidstone in 2010 on an anti-corruption platform. Um, I, I was sectioned by a solicitor who, as I now know, was pretending to be a judge in the Maidstone Magistrates Court. Um, and I wasn't ever assessed, like the Tutu boy, he, he was sectioned without ever being assessed by a psychiatrist. I was sectioned without ever being assessed. It was on the orders of um, a solicitor who was acting as a judge in the Maidstone Magistrates Court. And I got sent to a secure psychiatric unit uh, in Crawley. And the diagnosis, which is the typical diagnosis for whistleblowers, e.g. Uh, Carol Woods, social worker, um, was delusional disorder. But while so ill that I had to be locked up so I couldn't even post a letter <laughs> or put in an election petition, I was given a laptop and I, I put some very, very detailed election complaints in via email because I couldn't get out. Including, uh, at that time, Lord Newberger was master of the roles and he was... Um, sitting over an inquiry into the use of injunctions and super injunctions. And I wrote and told him. I've recently written to him again and said he needs to have another look at injunctions and super injunctions because he didn't deal with it at that time in 2010. So that's where we are. Um, the reason that they uh, wanted to section me because there are two scandals, two main scandals that they didn't want coming out in Maidstone. One is the BMI healthcare one, and the other one is involving my ex-husband, um, an upper class Freemason. And all the things that have been happening between me and him since I got rid of him with a lifelong court protection order in 1980. I'm currently in conflict with Paul Carter, leader of Kent County Council, who is my daughter's father-in-law over what he did in relation to the scandal involving my ex-husband. In 2003, um, after 23 years of harassment, despite my lifelong court protection order, I got so fed up with everything, I went down to the Maidstone uh, police station and I got a um, police inquiry, SI 11903, and I was interviewed as a victim of um, rape and other serious uh, crimes in relation to my ex-husband. So that was all recorded, all on CCTV. Uh, on, on, they've got film footage of that. What I now know is that the, uh, the police said to me, um, please give me the evidence uh, of your lifelong court protection order. So I went down to the Maidstone County Court and I, I managed to get them to find my 1980 file and they got my lifelong court protection order and the violence I was talking about and what was going on was much worse than I'd even said on the interview. So I took it back to the police station and, and uh, they had the evidence they wanted so they should have been ready to arrest him. Well, they did arrest him uh, they arrested him and bailed him. 
and I presume as part of that process they took his DNA. But when they had a, a look at what his current situation was, despite my lifelong court protection order and all the things that I'd been um, complaining about in relation to him for years, he, they found at that time he was um, a primary school governor in Kent, KCC primary school governor. He was also a sitting magistrate in the Folkestone Magistrates Court. But the harassment around me at that time was horrendous. I was frightened for, for, for the safety of my children. And what happened next was um, having um, bailed him and whatever they found, they thought, oh God, this is a, a vote losing scandal. They decided to turn the tables on me and I'd sent KCC Education a copy of my lifelong court protection order. KCC Education, which was under the control of Paul Carter at that time, then instructed um, Maidstone uh, Ashford CID to arrest me for harassment. Yeah. So I was. I was arrested for harassment, taken to uh, um, Ashford Police Station, and um, questioned intensively uh, about two unsolved crimes in Maidstone. Who does and who doesn't know about the unsolved 1980 Sandling rapes? Um, and the, these rapes were ones that I had responded to a Maidstone Police radio appeal about in 1980 after my husband had been removed from our home for um, assisting my attempted suicide. And I answered a police radio appeal the next day um, to, to give um, information to solve the second Sandling rape. Years later, I found out that despite being a, a victim of very severe domestic violence um, from a man who clearly was very mentally ill, um, that police told him that I was the informant and 36 years of harassment have continued uh, with nuisance calls and whatever and stalking since that time. But um, what was decided was whatever they found as a result of my inquiry, SI 11903, Maystone Police, it was decided to stick me on trial for harassment. Where did they put me on trial? Well, they put me on trial in the Folkestone Magistrates Court where my ex-husband's in the court that he sits on the bench with his grandmaster. Yeah. And I was made to go through. They wouldn't let me do, give the rape interview um, that I'd already given to Maystone Police. They made me go through the whole rape process um, in the court. The Kent messenger was sitting in the hearing, recording it with the permission of the judge. And um, basically, um, my ex-husband was put on the stand um, and he admitted um, the rape and they had, the CPS had to caution him and say, don't implicate yourself anymore. Anyway, the judge believed both him and me. Yes, he'd done this. He'd raped me and then said to me, um, well, you should have got over the rape years ago and then uh, convicted me for harassment. And at that time, that suited those running Kent because Mrs. Ledwin Domain had died a few months earlier. So they had a big problem with the BMI 6.6 .6 billion profit. And they had a big problem, vote losing scandal, um, with my ex-husband being a magistrate and being a, a, a junior school governor, given all the crimes I've been reporting him to, including terrorizing my three-year-old daughter back in 1987 in her bedroom late at night. Um, so they had a big problem. Now, if, if myself as Kent Businesswoman of the Year, thoroughly decent, respectable person who's never committed a crime in her life can be criminalised and put through that sort of process, then nobody is safe in Kent. Anybody could be criminalised. Any decent person can be criminalised. So, yes, um, if I'd been allowed to stand in 2010, I would have spoken about both of those 
um, things. But what happened was, and Whittacombe, once I was driven out of Maidstone with threats to section me via the homeless uh, place in Knight Rider Street, I went up to Carlisle, but soon after that, Anne Whittacombe followed me up there. And um, she went up there on the guise of going to a very small town with a few hundred people, Brampton, to save their cottage hospital, 400 miles away from Maidstone. After she'd been, things got much worse for me. Uh, that was in 2006. And um, about six months later, I heard, um, because Carlisle's a very gossipy place, the news agent in the main street, Dave, told me that Judith Patterson, um, a local female mason, had been offered the safe conservative seat of Maidstone. So I thought, oh, OK, I need to get a message to the Maidstone Conservatives. So what I decided to do was to send a fax from Carlisle to Judge uh, Patience, who was the lead criminal judge in Maidstone. And what I sent was a suspicious activity report. And I said, suspicious activity report, safe conservative seat of, of Maidstone has been offered to Judith Patterson, one of the Carlisle sisterhood. Well, at that time, Judith Patterson was an ex-mayor of Carlisle and um, she was one of Cameron's A-list candidates. Well, after I sent that fax, she disappeared. She never got any safe seat anywhere. And if you do a Google search of her name, you can barely find that she lives in Brampton. All publicity has disappeared. All publicity of Anne Whittacombe going to Cumbria has disappeared, and she went twice. She went up to a horse show at, in Appleby after that. But, um, it's all disappeared, including all the stuff about Anne Whittacombe with the um, people monitoring my phones, my communications, etc. It's all been wiped. So, yes, I managed to stop the first member of the Carlisle Sisterhood from getting the safe conservative seat of Maidstone, but I didn't stop the second. Um, so we now have Helen Grant as an MP. And yes, lots of favours were done up in um, Cumbria, Carlisle, for Maidstone and people were rewarded up there for what they did to cover up for these scandals down there and to um, make sure I couldn't stand and, and to give me hell. I mean, I went through absolute hell up there as well, but they're not as nasty up there, the female Masons, as they are down here. They find it harder to do the same things that they were doing down here. One of the, fa one of the other favors that happened in Carlisle was that the MD of the Carlisle News and Star that had been defaming me, um, that I complained about to the elections officer and started the defamation proceedings, Chris Biscoe, well, he ended up as the MD of the Kent Messenger in Maidstone. Oh, that was nice, wasn't it? And then, what else? We had, I was living in a housing association, Carlisle Housing became Riverside Housing, and they ended up with contracts down here in Maidstone too. And what other Carlisle Maidstone connections do we know? We know um, Yvonne Stewart Taylor up in Cumbria and Councillor Sheena Williams down here. So um, those are a few illustrations of um, what was going on um, to stop me telling people about these two main scandals. But um, where I've got to the point now is that um, I have, I'm a member of social groups in Maidstone and I happened to be at one of these social groups, one of my regular social groups, a few weeks ago. And I turned to the person sitting next to me and I said to him, I'd like to give a talk on how Maidstone scandals are covered up. And he said, yes, yes, when would you like to do that? And he's talked about next year. And the woman next to me said, um, has this got anything to do with our MP, Helen Grant? I said, yes. And she said, oh, she said, I was there at the selection process of selecting Helen Grant in January 2008. There were nine candidates and it was fixed. She said, um, first of all, they said it had to be a woman. And then they said that it had to be Helen Grant. And I said, yes, I know it was fixed because I know how it was fixed up in Carlisle. And um, on the back of what I was told at this social gathering, I started my uh, election complaint 
against um, Helen Grant. And I've got the file, which I'm going to complete tomorrow. And the file is called The Misuse of Psychiatrists to Cover Up for Avoidable Deaths and to Rig the Maidstone and Wield General Election Results. Now, the reference to avoidable deaths it has got more than one reference, but I'm only going to speak about one of them. Um, I believe that if people have been doing their job right, when I was complaining in Maidstone 2001 in the Maidstone County Court, Maidstone Police, uh, and Widdicombe KM, uh, that the C. difficile deaths, the avoidable C. difficile deaths, wouldn't have happened. And by the time I was driven out of Maidstone, 30 avoidable C. difficile deaths had, had occurred. Um, so that's why that is called that. And I believe that the C. difficile victims who I read uh, wanted answers. I, I tried to speak to Mary Graham at the Cape Messenger and she's obviously had difficulty knowing the answers in, in facing the, the relatives, but I believe that people have the right to know why their loved ones died. And um, that's where I'm at, really. I'm about to finish this election um, file tomorrow. It's going up to the Royal Courts of Justice, the finish for the last bit of it, to Sir Bergen, Bernard Hogenhauer, to um, the Duke of Kent, so that he can sort out the sisterhood problems. And... Um, and I'm sending a file into Maystone Police Station, even if they don't want it. But so I've, I've got three investigations in Maystone Police Station, all linked. The, um, the one 15 years ago, the BMI Summerfield one, the one in, in 2003, my ex-husband, and then the repossessions, um, which I got a, a reference for four years ago, and none of those have progressed, but they've all linked. So basically, I've been pushing for all three of those to be sorted because of, of proceeds of crime implications. I think because of the scandals are so horrendous in Maidstone that a High Court judge has to come down to Maidstone and sort out the high level of corruption that's going on in the courts. When you can put a victim of harassment, a victim of rape, a witness to serious crimes on trial in a blaze of publicity. Something extremely badly wrong. And as I said, I've been investigating what it is, what is the mechanism that keeps scandals covered for, for years and years. We've had the recent Hillsborough, which Russia today have exposed the Freemason connections. And what happened with Hillsborough was that the Sun newspaper blamed um, the Liverpool supporters. And to this day, the Liverpool supporters Liverpool, pe people in Liverpool will not buy the Sun newspaper. Well, I know the mechanism that covers up for all these scandals in Maidstone and in Kent is the Kent Messenger. And my problems with the Kent Messenger go back to 1980 when my ex-husband was committing crimes against me with a Kent Messenger reporter who he went on to marry. Um, and if it wasn't for the Kent Messenger, these scandals couldn't remain buried. But a lot of what's, what I've said is actually a public record in the Kent Messenger. And I, I believe that if the Maystone public uh, were to know all the things I know, and I know a lot about the Kent Messenger, if they were to know what the Kent Messenger has been getting up to, it would be the same in Maystone as it is in Liverpool. People wouldn't buy the Kent Messenger, it would collapse. And I think the Proceeds of Crime Act needs to be applied to the Kent Messenger too.